Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Well, I'm the teaching pastor here. If you're like, who's that guy up there? Um, I have, man, do you guys realize that in this month, it will be five years that I've been here? Isn't that crazy? I've never been anywhere five years in my life. That's, anyways... That's a testament, I think, to our wonderful pastors, Marcus and Natalie Avalos. We are so grateful for them. Wonderful people started this church, what, about 13 years ago? I've been faithfully serving, reaching here in Seguin. And man, they just love this community. And I'm so grateful for their hearts. So, uh, hey, real quick, I wanted to do a little personal update on a couple of things. Some people have been asking, and I'll just want to share with you guys. So earlier this year, we did that book, or we did that uh, series called The Circle Perspective. Do you all remember that? So, um, I found out that the book is actually not going to come out until 2023. (laughs) I know, but I'm actually kind of glad about that. So uh, I just finished writing the book last week. I finished the last chapter, and it looks like they're actually going to change the name of the book to call, call it Connecting the Dots, Finding Meaning in Every Season of Life. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, You know, when you you sell a book to a publisher, they get to decide what it's called. So... uh, Anyways, so that'll be out in 2023, those of you who've been asking, and I'm working on another book right now, and uh, the one about the Rescue Your Father that we did, too. Uh, That was a couple weeks, months ago, too, wasn't it? So, also, one more thing. Some of you, we've got a lot of new people to come. I send out a weekly encouraging email. Uh, It's usually on Tuesdays, and if you are not signed up for that, here's how you can sign up for that. Just text my name to this phone number, 44144. Or you can put your phone up and scan that QR code. It'll show you what to do. You can get signed up, and I'll send you a weekly email. It won't spam you, um, I promise. So that's, yeah, if you're interested in that, you can do that right now. Moving along. Here's what I want you to do. Everybody, for a second, I want you to close your eyes. I'm not going to do anything shady. Just close your eyes. (laughs) And I want to ask you a question. What do you want right now? Think about it. See if you can visualize it in your mind. Maybe for some of you, you want more joy in your life. Some of you want more love. You feel like your marriage just isn't what it used to be. Some of you wish you had a little more control over your environment. Some of you wish you had more financial freedom. Some wish you had more time, maybe a better relationship with your kids. You got it in your mind? Now, next question. Who do you know who has what you want? I see a scowl coming on some of you guys' faces. Okay, you can open your eyes. You got this? All right, so I want you to think about that throughout the rest of this message. Because today we're going to talk about envy. Wanting somebody, something that somebody else has. And we all, listen, I know this about you because I'm the same way. We all know somebody in our life that every time we see them and we see that they've got what we want, we go, right? Some of you have removed friends on Facebook because you're just so sick of seeing their vacations. Right? Eh, I know how it rolls. Some of you, you've removed friends on Facebook because you're so sick of seeing how perfect their kids always look. You're so sick of seeing how perfect they always look. Like, how they always look so put together. You know, oh, I just woke up morning, morning out of bed selfie. <laughs> and they look all put together and you're like, what? How come I can't look that good rolling out of bed? <laughs> Some of you have got somebody that you know that they, you're a family member and you just hung out with them last weekend and they just irritated you because they, all they talk about is money. And what irritates you most isn't that they talk about money, it's that they got way more than you. You got that family member that's that way? Anybody relate to that? You're like, man, we're all scrimping and saving over here, and they're just like blowing through money, and if I had that kind of money, I wouldn't be that stupid with it. And (laughs) It is what it is. So listen, I know that every one of us, we've all got somebody in our life that's that way, right? And, And here's the thing. C.S. Lewis one time said, comparison is the thief of joy. When you are comparing yourself to others, it's not going to go anywhere but bad. Because as you're comparing, you're always going to find somewhere where somebody's faster, smarter, 
better looking, further along than you are. And it tends to create this within us. It doesn't feel right. And you look at it and you go, how did they get that? That's not fair. And it just messes up our joy. Some of us, that's the reason we don't like hanging out with our family. is because we're constantly comparing ourselves to where they are versus where we were or where we thought we should be by now. In, King, uh, in 1 Thessalonians, it says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. So we're going to talk today about the connection between gratitude and how gratitude is the solution to envy, to jealousy, to comparison. Because gratitude, I believe, is the answer for how we can find contentment right where we are instead of the lack of joy that a lot of us feel when we get around that one person that we're just like, how do they have that and I don't? And if you're always comparing, you're just going to have this lack of joy in your life. So that's where we're going today. But first, I want to share something really profound and deep with you, okay? So I need you guys to lock in with me. I'm going to do this as best as I can. When I saw when I read this for the first time, I'm like, oh my goodness, this pretty much explains everything. There's this philosopher, his name is René Girard, okay, he was this French dude, and he came up with this theory, okay, now stick with me, some of you guys are like, oh, I didn't want, I didn't come here to go to school, stick with me, okay, this is really important, I'm going to go somewhere with this. He came up with this theory called mimetic desire. He basically says the whole world is driven by mimetic desire. Now, mime, you know what a mime is? A mime is somebody who like copies other things, and we all have this tendency within us to copy other people. And he says that the, the desire to copy, to mimic other people is the driving force in society and human nature. He says it's the idea that imitation is the force that shapes human desire. People desire things because someone else, a model, did first. The best way I can come up with an example for this is when I was in high school, I had this friend named Joanna, and we were close. And I wanted her to be more than a friend. I wanted her to be my girlfriend, but I was afraid to ask her because I didn't want to ruin the friendship. You know how that goes, right? Then my other friend, my good friend Wes, who is still my best lifelong friend to this point, uh, he just swooped in and started dating her. <laughs> and I remember confronting him and I said, dude, what are you doing? He's like, oh, you know, you weren't dating her. And I was like, you knew I liked her. And he had no interest in her before he knew that I liked her. And he could have gotten any girl in the school. I know because he did go with every girl in school. But <laughs> sorry if you're watching, Wes. Anyways, I'm like, why you got to take the one I want? And have you ever noticed that? There was this movie back in the 80s called Can't Buy Me Love. Where this, you remember that movie? Where the guy, he convinces the most popular girl in the school to date him for a month and he'll give her $1,000 to pay for this dress that she ruined of her mom's. And, and he's like, if I can get you to date me, all the other girls will find me attractive. And his little plan works. So he dates this girl and then like everybody thinks, all these girls are like, oh my gosh, he's so appealing. That's mimetic desire. As soon as you see somebody that wants something, have you ever seen this with little kids, little four-year-old kid? There's like a room full of toys and a little four-year-old boy goes and gets one little train and starts playing with it. And there's hundreds of other toys. But what does every other boy in that room want to play with? That's us, y'all. We're all a bunch of little four-year-old boys, right? So here's the idea behind mimetic desire. It's our similarity that causes division, jealousy, and envy, not our differences. Now, here's, here's this popular mantra going out around the world that says, if we can just understand each other's differences, we'll all get along. We can solve all the world's problems with diversity and understanding diversity. And listen, I'm all for diversity because God created diversity. But listen, there's no amount of understanding of other people that's going to stop our conflict. Because you know why? It's our common bond, the thing that we share with others that creates our problems. In fact, James says it this way. James talks about mimetic desire. This is James, the brother of Jesus. He says, do you know what causes fights and quarrels among you? You know what quarrels are? Quarrels are just fights. It's a fancy way of saying fights. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Like you want one thing and he wants the same thing and so y'all are all fighting over it. It's the fact that we're similar is the reason that we fight. Because we want the same stuff. It's not because we're different. 
You desire, but you don't have, so you kill. You know, the number one like, reason for murder in our, in our world is relationships gone south. It's like people that were formerly in love end up killing. Isn't that crazy to think about? And they both wanted the same thing. They both wanted love. And it drove someone to kill. It says, you covet. Oh, am I still there? Coveting is want, wanting something that's not yours. That's the simple definition for covet. We don't sit around saying that. Man, I really covet that horse over there. You don't say that, right? <laughs> but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Y'all all want the same stuff, and you're just fighting over it. You do not have because you do not ask God. So this is the idea. Listen, this is where you have to shift your thinking a little bit. We think sometimes that the reason we fight the most is because we're so different. But the reality is the reason we fight the most is because we want the same stuff. And you say, well, what do you mean? I, I don't know if I want the same stuff as my spouse. Or I don't know if I want the same stuff as my brother. Okay, here's the three things. Now, listen, if you've hung around me for more than 10 minutes, you've heard me talk about this. So those who know this, stick with me. Okay, here's the three things you want. Right here, it's all wrapped up in this little triangle. Every one of us, by the way, this book, if you're like, I'm going to blow through this. So if you want more on this, this book is available in the back. I only bring it when I'm speaking about the topic, but it's available in the back if you want to get it, where I unpack this concept. Every one of us wants security. You want to feel safe. You want to feel financial security. Maybe you want to feel emotional security. That's the reason you married that guy, because you're like, man, he'll keep me emotionally safe. You had a father who didn't protect you emotionally, and you're like, this guy will, right? And that's why you married that person. You want, we all want a sense of connection. We want to feel seen, heard, known. We want to know that somebody sees and listens to what we're, we're saying and thinking. And we all want a sense of control. Okay, now some of us, we've all got one that's a little more sensitive for us. Mine, as you all know, is control, right? So when I see somebody that's got like a setup, their life set up to where they have everything in their control, I want that kind of a life. That's what, 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 control, what, what control looks like for me as somebody who has control over all of their own decisions, which is why I have a really hard time working for a boss. Because they control me. <laughs> Five years ago when Marcus asked me to come on board here, I, he's like, hey, what would it take to bring you on board? I said, there's no dollar amount you can give me to bring me on board. He said, why? And I was like, I love you, man, but you will control me. He's like, I won't control you, I promise. I'm like, I don't believe you. Everybody wants to control me. <laughs> y'all are laughing because some of y'all feel the same way, right? <laughs> this is why I've, 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 it's been a long time since I've had a real boss because I want control. Now, some of you, connection is so important, and that's why you love your work environment. And that's why, man, COVID killed the work environment thing. You're like, I this connection thing. I, online is not connection, okay? And security. Now, so this is what we all want, right? And it looks different for all of us, okay? And so when we get in conflict, it's because something we want, we're not getting. And here's what happens in mimetic desire, the fear of mimetic desire. When we can't get what we want, we develop what's called a scapegoat. A scapegoat is the person, the group, or group that a society decides they need to blame for not being able to get what they want. So... Here's a hypothetical scenario. This is purely hypothetical. This, would, this is not based in anything. It's just purely hypothetical. So just track with me. Let's say that a global pandemic started. <laughs> that, hold on. I know what you're thinking. Just wait. This is purely hypothetical. And it came, it originated somewhere across the ocean in some foreign land. And it came and it swept the whole world. And all of a sudden, all of this was threatened for everybody. Security, connection, control. Like it was all threatened because of this random global pandemic that has no name. All of this was threatened. Your sense of security. I don't know if who's got it and who doesn't. I can't go out there. and just, uh, uh. Your sense of connection. Churches are closed. Nobody can meet. We can't do anything, right? Control is right. No, the, the government started. But if the, imagine if the government started making rules about what you had to do because of this global pandemic. Just <laughs> hypothetical. We're all freaking out, right? And so here's what some people do. They're like, who's to blame for this? You know what it is? It's those people on the other side of the ocean who, who probably created this thing. Scapegoat. Well, imagine hypothetically a vaccine comes along. I'm going to step on everybody's toes this morning and say, hang on. Imagine hypothetically a vaccine comes along and everybody starts getting the vaccine, but there are certain people that are like, I'm not getting that vaccine. 
So then the people that are vaccinated, they start going, oh, you know who's to blame for this pandemic still going? It's the people that aren't vaccinated. I told you I'd step on everybody's toes. It's what we do, don't we? We always find somebody to blame. And it causes conflict. And it's because we all want the same stuff. We all want security. We all want connection. And we all want a sense of control. And the really challenging part is we see people who have what we want. And we get envious and jealous of them. Which is why one of the Ten Commandments addresses this. Remember back here in James, it says, it says, you guys covet. You want things that aren't yours. And, and you know, one of the Ten Commandments that God laid out, one of the formulas for how to live in harmony with the world around you was this. He says this, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. Don't covet. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. And I'm like, what a weird list of stuff, right? I started thinking about it, and I was like, actually, I feel like in, in the world of selfie, gym selfies, the King James was particularly insightful because it says, you shall not covet your neighbor's ass. <laughs> and I know a lot of women are like, why can't I have a booty like her? <laughs> Don't do it. It's King James, y'all. It's in there. He saw it coming. Anyway, so I started thinking about this. I'm like, why would he put this list of things? And I thought, man, this, this list of things speaks to the exact thing that we all struggle with the most. Here's why I think he listed these things. Don't covet your neighbor's male servant. What does a servant do? They make your life easier. What does a female servant do? Hopefully make your life easier. What does an ox do? Well, back in the days when you had to plow the ground, they made your life way easier. They'd pull that, uh, the plow for you. Their, their donkey, what did the donkey do? Transportation. Here's what I think this is saying. Don't envy how much easier you think your neighbor or friend's life is. And isn't that what we all do? Gosh, man, his life is so much easier than me, and he doesn't even, he's not even grateful for what he's got. Who's the not grateful one? And when we do that, it just steals our joy. And we're walking around complaining. And I think this is the driving force behind what's going on a lot in America today. We say we want justice, but what we really have is envy that somebody has it better than us. But the reality is every one of us have it way better than anyone in the history of the world has ever had ever do your research read some history have some humility you ain't the first this this isn't the world's first rodeo we've been doing this for a long time and things have gotten a lot better than what they used to be now there's there's room to improve no doubt but you know where we start with we don't start with envy we start with gratitude for what we have because because but the danger is is this if, if you start to covet and you go man I just, I wish I had that. I wish I had this. I wish I had that. And, and, and it kills gratitude so quickly, which is why I think God said right at the beginning of when he laid out the law, he's like, if you start doing this, it's not going to go well. Because the, the Ten Commandments, everything God asks of us is for our good. It's for our confidence. It's for our joy. And it's for we can live in harmony with the things we see and the things we don't see. And if you want to live in that harmony, it's never going to work with envy. And the real challenge we face today is this. Most of what we compare ourselves to and our lives to isn't even real. It's carefully crafted. It's image crafting. It's somebody taking 70 pictures, making sure every hair is in the right place. You know this. A lot of you took family pictures for Thanksgiving, trying to get 14 people in the picture all smiling. It doesn't work. You have to Photoshop some smiles on, right? There's that one kid that's always like, And we don't show those pictures, right? So, like, so last week, my, you know, my dad and I were building this retreat center in Kerrville, and I showed this video 
of how the pr progress is coming on the retreat center. And I've been super overwhelmed by this project, but people see the project and, and where it's at now, and they're like, wow, it must be so amazing to own a retreat center. I'm like, yeah, you saw that video, but you didn't see this picture. <laughs> Welcome to my life. Yeah. I don't put this on Facebook because that's not cool or inspiring. And it doesn't make people want my life. This is me digging in a hole of mud, trying to figure out an electrical problem. And you'll see even here, we even have this on the wrong way. Like, there's so many things wrong in this picture. But I don't post that picture. And what's really thing is, like, it's just a natural thing. You want to post your best side on Facebook, on Instagram. But it's lies. I'll never forget, I had spent time, I talked to this girl for like two hours, and she just had her world fall apart. Her boyfriend had dumped her. She had lost her job. She lost her apartment. She was living in a flea bag hotel in Las Vegas to top it off. And I just heard, she just cried in tearful two hours, and my life is ruined. It's over. <laughs> I get off after I pray with her, and I see on Facebook, she posts a picture of her. She's in her swimsuit. She's got her legs kicked up next to this pool. It's the pool from the flea bag hotel. Um, but it's aimed in such a way you can't see it's a flea bag hotel. All you see is a pool and an adult beverage and her legs sticking out in the sun. And she's like, self-care time. <laughs> Hashtag. And everybody's writing her, I wish I had your life that I could do that in the middle of the week. I'm like, you know why she can do that in the middle of the week? She ain't got a job. But all these people. Now, was she intentionally trying to deceive? I don't think so. I think she was trying to convince herself. And that's what a lot of people do right now on social media is they're trying to convince themselves. In fact, call me cynical, but I've gotten to the point where the more I see somebody posting pictures of them with their wonderful honey, talking about how proud they are of their honey, and I love this guy, and I love this woman, and she's such an amazing blah, blah, the more I'm like, whoo, their marriage is struggling. <laughs> call me cynical, but I'm a pro, y'all. I've seen this over and over again. I have a master's degree in counseling. I know what to look for. And when I see that too much, I'm like, oh, somebody's struggling. A few weeks ago, a friend of mine started posting all these pictures of him. And anyways, I, I called that, that friend of mine's parents. I'm like, their marriage is in trouble. And they're like, oh, it's bad. I'm like, yeah. I can tell by all the lovey-dovey pictures. Remember that uh, Shakespeare, methinks thou dost protest too much? That's what we do. We try and work it out on Facebook. But all the while, we're showing this glamorous thing and everybody else is just looking at, we're looking at, we're envying, we're comparing. Man, they've been on two cruises in the last six months? Yeah, they're trying to salvage their marriage. How come I can't go on a cruise? Well, because you're being responsible, right? I don't know. Like, <laughs> comparison will ruin it all for you. Don't do it. So what do we do about this tendency we all have to imitate? Here's, here's what we do. This is where the Apostle Paul addresses this. He says, guys, listen, you're all imitators. You all have that mimetic desire, that tendency to mimic and copy. God put that in you. But there's one person he wants you to copy. You're made in the image of God. So there's something that you're supposed to copy. And it says this, it says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love. You know that security, that connection, that control that you want? The only place you're going to get it is from the place you were made to get it from. You were created from love, created for love, and called to return to love. When sin separated us from God's love, he loved the world so much he sent his only son to pay the price for our separation from him, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. We're called to return to the only place that we'll ever get the security, connection, and control we want, and that's God's love. That's what he says, walk in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I thought, it's interesting, this fragrant offering. I, I think, have you ever been around somebody that's just content with where they are and who they are? It's kind of a sweet thing to be around. You're like, this is a pleasant person to be around. They don't always have to one-up me. They don't have to prove they're further along than me. They're not always comparing. I think this is, this is what it looks like to be an imitator of Christ. It's walking in contentment of saying, look, Man, I'm not all I could be. I know that. And I'm going to strive towards that. And God's working in me to accomplish those purposes. He will accomplish the work he started in me. 
man, but thank goodness I'm not what I used to be. And the only person you should ever compare yourself to is who you were yesterday. Never compare yourself to who someone else is today. Only compare yourself to who you were yesterday. Are you becoming more like Christ? Are you becoming more of an imitator of how God is? Are you seeking more the security, connection, and control from him than you are from your spouse or from your job or from whatever you think is going to give it to you? There's all sorts of things we think are going to give us those things. Are you, where are you seeking it? Because only when you seek him through that are you going to find the thing we all want, security, connection, and control. And that's the love that binds us together. When I recognize, man, you're fighting a hard battle wanting the same thing I want, how do we come together and do our best to make sure that we all get the same thing? Because it's not our differences that draw us, the, that separate us. It's that we all want the same thing. That son you're struggling with, he wants the same thing as you do. It may look different, and he may be acting out in ways that you're like, what are you thinking? But somehow he's convinced it's giving, gonna give him some sort of security, connection, or control. Drugs are often the response to lack of feeling a lack of connection. Self-absorption, narcissism are a response to feeling a lack of security. If nobody will look out for me, I'll look out for myself. Obsession with control and perfectionism is a response to control. And you're like, why can't he just chill out? That's what my wife says to me all the time. Why can't you just chill out? Because you know what I do when I get stressed out? I start looking for that, if I can just control everything, if I can control it. I'll have what I want. And then we end up getting in fights because I'm trying to control everything. Right? That's how it rolls out. We all want the same things. And when our desires come in conflict, we clash. And then we end up coveting the things that we, from others that think, who we think have what we want. And God says, look, the answer to all that is I want you to be grateful. Give thanks in all things. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You may start this, be starting this morning going, man, my life is so not what I thought it would be. My marriage is not what I thought it would be. And here we're coming to Christmas time. I dread this time of year. Here's what I would encourage you to do. Today, go home, grab a piece of paper, and write down 10 things you're grateful for. Just start focusing on what you're grateful for, on what you have, not on what you don't have. And then every day over the next 30 days, leading up to Christmas, Add to that list something you're grateful for. And you can't repeat. No repeats. Keep writing things you're grateful for. And you're going to find there are tons of things to be grateful for. And when you are grateful for what you've got and keep your eyes off of what you don't have and what you think everybody else has, you're going to find a sense of joy filling your heart. And isn't that what Christmas is about? Joy. Joy to the world. That's my encouragement for you guys today. You receive that? Can you imagine what it'd be like if you just stopped comparing yourself maybe you need to go home and delete your social media apps do it i'm so proud of emily she did that she deleted instagram she was sick of looking at my gym selfies and so <laughs> she deleted it she's like I, I you know i just look at these people and i know that this isn't even real but i keep going man but i want that <laughs> get really serious about it maybe the thing that you're missing this year from christmas is just deleting social media, turning off the TV, stop watching the advertisements, focus on the people that are around you, be grateful for what you've got, and you will find a joy flooding your life. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you so much for your gift of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. We start there, Lord. Apart from that, man, we would be in dire trouble. So we thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. We are grateful this morning for that. We did not deserve it, but you came and you gave your life. I pray for anyone this morning, this, man, they've just been feeling a lack of joy. That's been, maybe they've been feeling a sense of envy or, you know, something they just, why can't I have that? Why can't I have that? And, and I pray, Lord, that today they would just find contentment right there in what they have. And they would start with what they have and be grateful for that. And I believe that as we're grateful for what we have, you bring abundance. So I pray for anyone this morning that's just, and they know they've been struggling with envy, jealousy, whatever you want to call it pray, Lord, that you would just help them lay that down and trust you for that security, for that connection, and that sense of control in their life. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. 
Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.